morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this early morning session. Um, this is going to be a great session uh, and obviously focused on something that we're incredibly interested in in terms of how we manage our patients using high flow humidified therapies. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to sit next to Claudia Crimi from Italy as well, uh, and we'll be chairing the session. So I'd like to start to invite Jerry Kreiner up. Uh, Jerry's from Temple in the United States, and it's going to be great to hear about your work and the work around high flow and recent hospitalization. Jerry. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today, and uh, thank you, Nick and Claudia. So I'm going to talk about uh, really HFNT after a recent hospitalization and talk about the results of a feasibility trial that we did and what we have planned for the future in terms of a multi-center trial. These are my disclosures. The most important is, is that Fisher Paykel has funded the feasibility study and is helping to fund the um, overall multi-center trial. So as everyone in the room knows, acute exacerbations account for close to 70% of the total costs of COPD care, and a majority of that is driven by hospitalizations that account for a significant component of those costs. Furthermore, COPD is, in the U.S. at least, the third leading cause of rehospitalization, and rehospitalization is a sentinel event, it has significant associated morbidity, mortality, and also significant costs. And although many interventions have been used to prevent COPD exacerbations outside of Nick's trial, um, that uh, non-invasive ventilation in a select group of hypercapnic patients, it's not clear that any other interventions really decrease uh, rehospitalizations. So respiratory events, whether they're viral, bacterial infections, or environmental causes, they increase airways resistance and they increase mucus production and these cause worsened air trapping. And data by Stevenson and colleagues suggest that in hospitalized COPD patients who are already suffer from underlying hyperinflation, they have superimposed hyperinflation from that acute event by at least a half a liter. So hyperinflation from air trapping, we all know is a bad actor. It increases dyspnea, it decreases exercise tolerance, it worsens quality of life, and because of its associated detrimental effects on thoracic and cardiac mechanics, it increases the need for hospitalization, need for invasive positive pressure ventilation, and contributes to mortality. So we postulate, as many others have, that high flow may benefit this patient group around the period of a severe exacerbation by improving airway humidification that could facilitate mucociliary clearance, decrease the work of breathing, reduce respiratory rate, prolong expiratory time, and contribute to a decrease in hyperinflation to patients when they are most vulnerable who have significant underlying lung disease. So produce a period of stability to prevent rehospitalization. So although there's good studies outside the US that suggest that high flow nasal therapy might benefit this patient group, that's not seen as enough evidence by US regulatory bodies and they need more evidence to support the use of high flow nasal therapy in patients at home with COPD. So in preparation for planning a multi-center trial, we conducted a single center feasibility trial to see what interventions that we could do. Do we have access to a patient population that's willing and would they comply with daily high flow nasal therapy? So we did a 90 day pilot in our institution where we looked at our ability to recruit subjects who would be eligible for the trial, what would be the major exclusion criteria for them to participate, and their willingness to comply with therapy. And we also wanted to look at how long would they use HFNT, what would be their parameters of use, what would be the, like, the ranges of flow rates and temperatures that they would accommodate, and whether there were any side effects that we could elicit that would result in poor tolerance or terminate their use of high flow. So this is our study scheme for this feasibility trial that we took patients, consecutive patients that were hospitalized at our institution in Philadelphia, which is a hybrid hospital like a city hospital and a private hospital. So we have patients that are pretty sick, some of them with reduced means of care. And we, uh, after they gave us informed consent, we collected baseline data, which was essentially 
vital signs, their level of respiratory burden at that time with a Likert scale, like how bad is your respiratory disease, uh, affect you. That's not a validated index, but we needed something that would be movable. Then we use validated indexes of redundancy to measure dyspnea, modified Borg, MMRC. We measure gas exchange or arterial blood gases, um, and we did simple spirometry, six-minute walk distance, and a host of questionnaires to characterize your uh, respiratory disease quality of life. And we also set a baseline da daily diary to measure their symptoms of dyspnea, mu mucus production, mucus purulence, mucus quantity, and basically measure daily peak flow. Then patients received high flow nasal therapy for three months or 90 days. And then the data I just talked to you about that we got a baseline, we repeated that at 90 days after the close of their treatment. This is our st uh, study flow diagram to the left, consort diagram. So we approached 41 consecutive patients. Our major screen out was basically patients that either had sleep apnea or had high risk for sleep apnea by stop bang questionnaire. That was three. So 38 patients were then scheduled to come back for your outpatient visit, and eight never showed up. So we had a 25% attrition rate, which is helpful for us to design our pivotal trial. And then we had 30 people that did show up, and 28 completed the 90 days, and most of those continued with high flow at the end of the study. The two people that dropped out, one dropped out for a lung transplant. We thought that was a legitimate excuse. And then the other patient dropped out after about two weeks because they only liked to sleep prone. And that was the most difficult position to have high flow in your nose and sleeping prone. So otherwise, the 28 patients complied with therapy. So we thought that was a good retention. Our patient population was fairly, I think, characteristic globally of what these patients look like, 69 years of age, we were gender balanced, male and female. We were also balanced in racial demographics in terms of Caucasian and non-Caucasian population. Patients were a little bit overweight. The mean BMI was 26. They had smoked a lot. They had 43-pack year history of smoking. They uh, were severely obstructed. About 75% uh, of them were gold stages three and four of airflow obstruction, more four than three. Their mean FEV1 was about 30%. Six-minute walk distance was about 223 um, uh, meters, and their breathlessness was severe. Seventy-five percent of them had either MMRCs three, most of them had four. And then in terms of burden of disease, your SGRQ is in the high 50s, 58. The CAT score was 21, um, and they had mild hypoxemia. Most of these patients were on some form of triple therapy, but as opposed to talking about long-acting bronchodilators in a poor patient population has less insurance, they were using combinations of short-acting agents because their insurance wouldn't provide for long-acting agents. But most of these were on triple inhaled therapy, and 50% of them were on prescribed long-term oxygen therapy on entry into the trial. What happened to the patients over time? Remember, this isn't uh, with a control. Uh, these are patients followed up over a period of time. So how much high flow contributed to their resolution of symptoms, we don't know. Um, but 70, uh, 90% of these patients had a reduction of dyspnea over the three months. 25% had a marked reduction in dyspnea. The rest of them had a mild reduction of dyspnea. And only 5% of people did, had no reduction in dyspnea over that period of time. When we looked at uh, secondary outcomes as shown here in the bottom left, there was no change in spirometric indices, but there was a signal of a trend of an improvement in six minute walk, an improvement in SGRQ, an improvement of the CAT score, which puts us in line with some of the prior reports of studying high flow at home in patients following hospitalization from prior reports. And we had a zero to 100 score, kind of a Likert scale of like how problematic was the putting the cannula in your nares. And you can see in the beginning, this is very mild discomfort because it goes up to 100 was severe. Um, so this is 30, and you can see that they settled down over a period of time. And nobody stopped the therapy or complained that much because of nasal irritation from the interface. From our daily diary, we got some signals of recovery of patients. And again, I don't know how much of this is high flow related or just resolution of exacerbation-like symptoms, but you can see Cough decreases over time. Patients had a decrease in sputum purulence, sputum thickness, and sputum quantity as we follow them over time and a resolution or uh, uh, improvement in their complaints of wheezing. 
And if we look at peak flow, we see that over time, there's a gradual increase in peak flow of patients. So not a worsening of lung function that we can see, but somewhat of improvement. So what we gather from this feasibility study is that it, it lent us to believe that it's feasible to do a daily high flow study that we could recruit patients. We had a uh, 1.25 to 1 in, uh, screen to enrollment ratio. Uh, most of these patients were compliant with therapy over a period of time. Um, half of these patients were on oxygen therapy. We didn't have to adjust their oxygen therapy as they were placed on, on the treatment and the therapy was well tolerated. Our mean use was 6.8 hours a night that patients used the therapy, and all patients but one tolerated 37 degrees temperature out of the 28. One of them had to go down to 35, so temperature was tolerated by them. The trends for improvement in SGRQ CAT and six-minute walk suggested that high-flow nasal therapy may have benefit in this group, has been demonstrated by other studies, and we thought the next step was a well-powered prospective multicenter controlled trial. So we went on to design that. And I'll briefly tell you about that, which is recently started in the US. We have 14 centers across the US, and this is a parallel group prospective randomized multicenter controlled phase three trial of home high flow nasal therapy via the MyAirvo 3 and the um, OptiFlow Duet Cannula Plus, plus usual medical care compared to usual medical care itself for at least one year and up to two years. And we wanted two years for two reasons. One is to show that if this is shown to be successful, which we hope, that we have some clue about the durability of the treatment effect in a patient population. And also to look at one of the, I thought, key elements of the Nagata study, which they're gonna present after me, was there was about 25% of the patient population that had hyper or uber frequent moderate exacerbations, like people that had three up to 18 exacerbations in the fall up of the years, to see if we could have more of an impact of treatment effect on that patient cohort. Um, it's 642 patients that we predict there are gonna be gold stage uh, three to four grade D patients uh, with moderate to severe COPD who are at risk for future exacerbations who have been hospitalized within the past six weeks. This is our study scheme. So these are gonna be patients hospitalized within the last six weeks. Again, given therapy, as I said, they'll come in and get baseline the assessment that I have under two, which is similar to what I described to you in the feasibility uh, study, but also with some expanded other testing points for EQ5D so we can do cost adjusted life years and PSQI to see if we have any impact on quality of sleep and a severe respiratory um, insufficiency questionnaire. Uh, patients will come in and be seen three, six, and 12 months, and for those who are in the study more than 12 months, they'll be seen at 18 months and then 24 months overall for these uh, test touch points. Our primary objective, it's a composite for the primary. It's the, if uh, HFNT, the MyAirvo3 plus, plus the uh, OptiFlow Duet plus cannula, will decrease the time to first moderate or severe exacerbation or all-cause mortality. And then our secondary endpoints will look at each of these uh, composites of the primary endpoint plus the frequencies or rates of moderate and severe exacerbations. And then other secondary endpoints are, as you can see there, quality of life, dyspnea reduction, and um, some a priori assessments of what patient populations may more selectively benefit from this therapy the ones more compliant, the ones that could tolerate higher flow rates, the ones with more severe exacerbation, the ones with more frequent exacerbations, goes on to about seven pre-specified subgroups that are patients of interest. Why 642 patients? Well, our assumptions were this. We assumed it would have a 30% effect size, and we thought that we'd have 80% power. Uh, we would have 15% dropout. With a cohort that we use, which is the NIH COPD Clinical Trials Network sites, that uh, we usually have 5% dropout, but we wanted to be uh, conservative, so we assumed 15% dropout to have this um, patient group of 642. Um, the patients who are assigned to high flow will be given a MyAirvo3 device, and that's of note because it's connected to the cloud. It can make daily device measurements of not only respiratory rate, but the hours of use that if patients wear a pulse oximeter, the heart rate and pulse oximetry also will be recorded by that. 
that's important to measure endpoints, but it's also important because we could use that as a compliance monitoring tool. That if patients don't use the equipment for two consecutive days, they get a prompt from the data coordinating center that the clinical site will remind the patient, hey, is, do you have a problem before we go a month and don't know that the patient hasn't been using their equipment. The control patient group, it's usual care, but we're giving them a smartphone. The smartphone will have the questionnaires, just like the MyAirvo 3 does, forgot to mention that. MyAirvo 3 will also, like our daily diary that we use in the feasibility trial, has an interface that it can capture patient symptoms of breathlessness, their respiratory uh, symptoms of how much sputum production they have or not, whether they're using rescue albuterol in the past 24 hours, and whether they've prescribed antibiotics or steroids. Smartphone will have that capability too from respiratory questionnaire, plus they'll have a pulse oximeter which they can measure heart rate and saturation and put that into the smartphone data. So they'll be able to get something more just an assignment of usual care so we can balance the intervention to both groups. These are our inclusion and ex exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria of what I've mentioned before. The exclusion criteria, they're mainly people that either have sleep apnea, using a PAP device, aren't expected to survive at least a year for their respiratory or non-respiratory conditions. They have major recent uh, craniofacial uh, surgery or their oxygen requirement is greater than 15 liters per minute. Um, this is our website and this is our um, clinical trials uh, NCT number and our Webflow uh, site. We've enrolled 12 patients so far and so far so good. We're excited about this and we think we're powered enough not only to show the primary endpoint, what place HFNT has in care of our patients who have been recently hospitalized, but also have the power to have the secondary endpoints addressed that so we know what patients benefit the most. Thank you very much. Should we stick to traditional? and ask questions. What is this traditional? Uh, yeah. I stay yeah, here. Yeah, you stay there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> I forget. It's yeah. been so long. <laughs> um, it, yeah, well, we've got you here, Joe. Um, can I just say thank you? That was really, really clear, um, and this is a really important area. The question I've got is around um, the patients, and you highlighted it, of their medical treatment being optimized before we're starting another treatment, because we don't want to be confounded by the fact we haven't fully optimized them medically. Um, and, and you mentioned about not all of them through reimbursement for the insurance were on triple therapy or, and I just want, are you going to, within the trial, um, are you going to drive towards make sure everybody's medically optimized? Yeah, so it's a good question, Nick. I mean, it's a challenge to really um, optimize usual care when you have to depend upon what coverage plan patients have in the U.S. because as opposed to other countries in the world, it's uneven, more in the U.S. probably than other countries because of their, their means. But we'll try to optimize them with all will be on triple therapy, yeah. people that are recently hospitalized. They might have to use short-acting therapy, which most people can get to complement the long-acting therapy lapse that some may have but we'll be able to try to make sure that. And we do have in our statistical plan the analysis for that, adherence to the routine usual care. And I think it's fair to say, you know, the challenge back to me is to say, well, Nick, how much does this change in resistance in a post-exacerbation period? And we just don't have that data about using these treatments or what they actually impact on. So I think it's really useful to collect that data as well to see how resist yep. airways resistance changed as you recover on the treatments. Is there any questions anybody's got great I can keep going so um, the, the, you said six point hours a night or a day let's 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 not time schedule so the, the, the question I've got is did you know the pattern of use of them of the patients in the feasibility trial were patients using nighttime daytime bit of both did, did you yeah, have that data? we did so most of the patients 80% uh, of their use was at nighttime about 20% okay. was spattered in the daytime. Some use it with exertion, uh, like using a bike or something for exercise or a treadmill, but most of them used it, just took a break during the daytime with the device also. And, and the f I may have missed it and I apologize. Um, the flow rate that the patients used? Yeah, that's right. I, did, I forgot to mention that. Uh, 25 to 35 liters was the range and most people were about 28. 
okay yeah i think that's just really helpful for everyone to know that you know when you go up to the higher flow rates it, it's not as well tolerated yeah. by the patients and so and and the important point as well um is that everybody was on in the in your feasibility 37 degrees and there was only just one person you just had to drop the temperature down because obviously the temperature makes a hugely important yeah. in terms of the water vapor that's or yeah. the water vapor that's carried as well it, one, th one thing about that point, we had a session yesterday about cannula, and <clears throat> we're preferentially using the Duet plus cannula in this case, just to see if we could optimize patient compliance, especially those who are going to be in the study for a long time, yeah. and tolerate maybe lower flow rates with that. Brilliant, Jerry. I'm, we're obviously really excited to see the results of this as they yep. come out. Thank you. Um, there may be one in the UK, who knows. Can I ask you one question about your feasibility study? Uh, yeah. About the, how did you collect the amount of sputum that patients uh, have daily? Yeah, semi-quantitated semi and subjective by the patient. So we so gave like them pictures of like teaspoons and how much, not, not mm -hmm. glass shots, but teaspoons of how much they mm -hmm. use. Alison. Say again. <coughs> no, no. Um, it's it's really electric driven. Okay. Yeah. So there will be three machi different machine. The gas driven that, that would be for the hospital, and yeah. then the other one that would be. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to use at home. Yeah. But you, yeah, you either we obviously connected to an oxygen concentrator yeah. Yeah. Um, and and for your trial they're going to be oxygen dependent or whatever's whatever up to 15 pay. liters yeah. rest, but most of the people in the feasibility <coughs> trial that we had they were really on one to three liters at most and that was essentially what we bled into the high flow okay thanks Joe. Uh, good is there any more questions uh, one question about the trial. Uh, did you exclude patient on um, hypercapnic patient? I didn't see hypercapnia in your Yeah, that's criteria. one thing I should have highlighted. We have no thresholds either low or high for hypercapnia. We're hyper, we're CO2 agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> but on the feasibility, it was 41.5 to 41.5. It didn't change for, for, for the oxygen seemed to go up by about three millimeters of mercury. Didn't exactly, it? slightly yeah. bumped up. Okay. Jerry, thank you. Okay, uh, always brilliant. So thank you very much. So uh, let's go um, on with the next speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nagata. He will talk about the safety and effectiveness of domiciliary nasal high flow therapy for stable hypercapnic COPD patient. I am Nagata from Kobe City Medical Center General Hospital. I'm happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. I would like to talk about the trial of high home high flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy conducted in Japan. Based on the result of the, this study, home high flow therapy is now covered by health insurance nationwide in Japan. So I will talk a little about that as well. This study was supported by funding from Tejin Pharma Limited. High flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy, HFNC is recently emerging therapy for respiratory care, mainly in the acute care setting. This therapy has several physiological effects, such as positive airway pressure, washout effect in dead space, and supplying warmth and humidified gas, leading to lesser workload when breathing. Although there has been much more evidence as a treatment for acute respiratory failure, the clinical benefit of domiciliary use remains unclear. This slide is a summary of the expected mechanisms by which HFNC leads to long-term improvement for COPD. HFNC is believed to have two major advantages over conventional oxygen delivery systems reducing workload of breathing and infection. These effects have been shown to be due to the various physiological mechanisms listed in this slide. 
In our pilot trial publishing analysis of ADS, we investigate the efficacy and safety of six-week domiciliary play HFNC for stable hyperkapnic COPD patients with PSCO2 ranging from 45 to 60 millimeters mercury already treated with LTOT. HFNC improves the mean SGLQC total score significantly by over seven points compared to LTOT alone. Additionally, there are significant improvements in PSCO2 by around 4 mm mercury, pH, and nocturnal PTCCO2 around 5 mm mercury with HFNC. In terms of adverse events, a total of seven events occurred during HFNC, but they were co all considered mild and no one discontinued their treatment. Based on this pilot trial, we conducted the Fivotel trial. The main concept of this study was randomized control trial assessing the effect of HFMC for a longer period only for most severe COPD patients with chronic hypercapnia and hypoxia. Enrollment period was from 2017 to 2019, and number of participating sites was 42. The result of this study was recently published in AGLCCM. The inclusion criteria were as follows. 20 years or older, COPD with goal stage 2 or above, receiving LTOT for at least 16 hours per day for at least one month, and with hypercapnic respiratory failure with PSCO2 higher than or equal to 45 mm mercury, and having moderate or severe COPD exacerbation within the past one year. The exclusion criteria was the following, having severe and unstable comorbidities or malignancy, history of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, having a suspicion of COPD or NIV use within the previous four weeks, and the patients with cognitive impairment or psychiatric disorder were excluded. Primary endpoint of this study was Caps for 52 weeks of moderate or severe COPD exacerbations. Secondary endpoints were as follows time to first moderate severe COPD exacerbation, time to death by all causes, health rated quality of life, arterial blood gas measurements, primary function tests, and adverse events. Participants completed the daily diary to record any increases in upper and lower respiratory tract symptoms, fever, or use of systemic corticosteroids or antibiotics. Definition of COPD exacerbation and severity in this study were as shown in the slide. On this slide, you can see the flow chart of this study. We initially enrolled 104 patients but excluded five owing to a lack of study treatments resulting in 99 patients in randomized. Six did not provide self records so the number of participants in the HFNC LTOT and the LTOT groups was 47 and 46, respectively. This slide shows the baseline characteristics of the participants. Overall, the majority of patients were male, elderly, severe stage of COPD, with mild hypercapnia with PSCO2 over 50 mm of mercury and with severe airway obstruction. There are no differences between the two groups. The primary endpoints count for 52 weeks of moderate severe COPD exacerbations were significantly lower in the HFNC LTOT groups than the LTOT group. 1.0 versus 2.5 per year. Time to first moderate severe COPD exacerbation was also significantly longer in the HFNC LTOT group. The histograms of COPD exacerbation 
in each group on the right of this slide shows the lower frequency of COPD exacerbations in the HFNCL dot group. The count per 52 weeks of COPD exacerbations with all severities were not different significantly. The counts of severe COPD exacerbations were not different significantly as well. There was no significant group difference in time to death by all causes. Two patients in each treatment group died during this study. We assessed health-related quality of life by SGLQC. Although HFNC treated patients had improved SGLQC total score at week 24 and impact score at week 12 significantly, there were no significant improvements at any of the observation points despite favoring trends for HFNC. In terms of PSO2, although there was favoring trend for HFNC, there was no significant improvement between two groups. HFNC treated patients had improved SpO2 only at week 52. In terms of primary function tests, although HFNC treated patients had improved FVC at week 24 and FEV1 at week 12, there were no significant improvement at any of the observation points. This slide shows the usage time and the flow rates of HFNC. The mean usage time of HFNC was over seven hours per day. A total flow rate were 28.5 liters per minute and oxygen flow rates were around 1.5 liters per minute. Now you can see that bus events, most aids of at least a moderate degree appear in several patients in both treatment groups. Infections present more than 5% frequency in the HFNC L dot and L dot groups, other respiratory, thoracic, and mediastinal disorders. In summary, HFNC L dot could reduce the COPD exacerbation frequency and prolong the duration between the moderate or severe COPD exacerbation. There were several variables with significant, statistically significant differences between the treatment groups. AEs were infrequent in both groups, suggesting that HFNC is a safe treatment. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, home HFNC has been covered by health insurance nationwide in Japan since April of this year. This is a list of indication criteria. In summary, patients with having subjective symptoms, and PSO2 with 45 to 50 mini, 55 millimeters mercury or 55 millimeters mercury or higher and a home mechanical ventilation is not suitable or when there is nocturnal hypoventilation. This is our way of setting up. As for the total flow rate, we start with an initial setting of 20 to 25 liters per minute and gradually increase the flow rate to 30 liters per minute or higher, taking discomfort in consideration. If patients can tolerate 40 liters per minute or higher may be used, but 35 liters per minute or higher is often difficult to achieve for long period. We adjust the flow rate according to efficacy, such as reduction in Disney and PSO2 and tolerability. As for temperature, 37 degrees Celsius is generally recommend, recommended, but it is often difficult to keep the uh, temperature at 37 degrees Celsius, especially during hot weather. We adjust the, the temperature within the range of uh, 34 to 37 degrees Celsius. And 31 degrees Celsius is now recommended due to insufficient humidification. 
In Japan, we mainly use for the patient with hypercapnic respiratory failure. Oxygen flow should be adjusted with the goal of achieving a SpO2 of 88 to 92 percent. In many cases, the same flow rate can be used as the home oxygen flow rate that was originally used. Finally, take home message. Home hypronasal counter oxygen therapy has been shown to be safe and effective in reducing exacerbations and improving quality of life. In Japan, home hypertherapy becomes covered by health insurance in 2022, and its use is expected to further expand in the future. Thank you for your attention. Obviously, the question is going to be a slightly more challenging uh, <laughs> to a video, um, but it's probably worth us just taking a moment, um, and if there's any thoughts for discussion. Um, I mean, I think from these data, it's interesting to look at the, the CO2, and in fact, there's no difference in CO2, but then if we think about the NIV studies, which took patients that were hypercapnic, and you see some resolution. So I think it's going to be really important we just know which target populations we're giving this to. And, you know, Jerry, your study will be um, hypoxic patients. Is, is they're going to be on LTOT or they're going to be on long term or they're just any, they're going to be a combination of non hypoxic and hypoxic uh, patients. Obviously, this one was hypercapnic. Um, and so, and then whether there'll be another study that's, that's focused just on a, um, folk that are hypoxic and hypercapnic again, which I think Maxime Patou in France is, is, is driving as well. So there's a number of studies that are going to be coming out. Um, I, I've just been writing it down. I think there's four or five studies that, that we're going to have, which are all going to be really helpful. And the primary endpoints are going to look, I think, pretty similar, which means meta-analysis will make it very, you know, much individual patient data meta-analysis will be really important for us to drive this therapy forward. So this has been a great session, Claudia. I really enjoyed listening to everybody's experience with this, but the, the, the whole idea of driving home the idea that we're going to do feasibility studies in trials before we move on to do big randomized control trials is really important. And we need to embed within those feasibility trials um, a qualitative approach to assessment of the patient's experience, which I think is kind of increasingly important that we do as well. Um, it's really exciting. This is a really exciting area. This is going to explode, I think, over the next five years um, when we're doing the individual, individual patient data meta-analysis in five years' time. It's going to show that these treatments, and this treatment in particular, um, is going to be useful for our most sick patients with COPD. Yes, I think we will have a very interesting data coming up, so stay tuned for the next results that are coming up. And so I think it was really, really an interesting session, and I would like to thank you, everyone, for coming here and have a pleasant Congress. Brilliant. <laughs>